Okay, so today we're starting not only a new standard, but we're also starting a, a new science concept, which is, we just finished up with life science, and now we're going into earth science. And when we get done with earth science, we will have completed all of our standards for the year. This video is sponsored by Great Courses Plus. Imagine taking a notebook, a plastic bottle, a toaster, and a glass container and burning them in fire. If the fire was hot enough, all the materials in these four things would break down into a gaseous mixture of molecules and atoms. If you make this fire hotter, all the atoms would break down into their component electrons and neutrons. If you go hotter still, these particles would break down into the fundamental particles of the standard model, things like quarks and leptons. And if you go even hotter, we're talking astronomical temperatures around 10 to the 31 degrees or about a million trillion trillion degrees Celsius, all the quarks and leptons of the four fundamental forces of nature would break down into one entity, a kind of soup where all the fundamental particles and the underlying forces responsible for their behavior would meld into one. This is what is... Okay, so this is what we're talking about now, the four fundamental faces forces has been proven they exist okay how they came about how the creation of earth came about there's different theories on it um we're going to talk about the big bang theory have any of y'all watched the show the big bang theory on that show it's not just all about the big bang but they're all scientists for you people that haven't watched it and on that show they talk it they they refer a lot to the big bang theory string theory and the loop theory and those are all theories and if the Big Bang Theory is their logic, is if the Big Bang Theory is true, then the string and the loop theories tie into it too. And those are all, could, could be proven, but they're all just theories right now. Uh, the two most popular theories of how the earth, the creation of our universe is the Big Bang Theory and then creation by God, okay? We're gonna talk about the Big Bang Theory. So, of the four fundamental forces, at one time, they were all one entity. That means they were all together, okay? You believe to have existed at the moment of creation, at the moment of the Big Bang. All the particles and forces of our reality came from this primordial soup. But this is the story of the four fundamental forces of the universe that, as far as is known, control everything in the universe, every movement, every phenomenon, and every process you can possibly think of. What is the nature of these forces? How do they work? And where do they come from? That's coming up right now. A typical modern particle theory represented by the standard model of particle physics. All matter is composed of six quarks and six leptons and their 12 antiparticles. All right, so last year we talked about matter. We know our three states of matter is um, solid, liquids, and gases, and then also plasma, which we don't go into plasma at this age level. But all of those types of matter has six quarks, six leptons, and 12 antiparticle pairs. Okay? All matter has that. Doesn't matter if it's a gas a liquid or a solid. It also has other things that makes them different, but they all have that. Kind of like, I guess you could compare it to like all humans have to have oxygen and we have blood flowing through our system. You know what I'm saying? But we're all still different. But that's not all. Matter is subject to four fundamental forces that cause this matter. And matter is also subject to, to four fundamental forces. 
and that's what causes the matter right, to behave in certain way to act the way it acts. Okay, and the result in essentially every action that you see all around. Now, this is only three of the fundamental forces, so just don't worry about writing that down. Just know that all matter um, is is controlled or hat or the four forces has something to do with them in one way or another. On you and everywhere in the universe. These four forces are the strong force which binds the nuclei of atoms. Alright, so he's going to talk about the forces and he tells you a little bit about each force, so we'll take that. But then we go back. He's not giving them to you in order as they come, as they separate. Okay? He's just telling you a little bit about it. So the first one he's going to talk about is the strong force. And the strong force, what it does is it binds the nuclei of the atom, the nucleus of the atom, the nuclei of the atom. Its job is in there. It binds it all together so that it holds the protons and the neutrons in place. So the strong force holds the protons and the neutrons in place. That's what the strong force's job is. Atoms, by holding protons and neutrons together in their center. Has everybody got that that chose to write? The main thing, you just need to know that the strong force holds the protons and the neutrons together. We should already know that we find those in the atom's nucleus, right? From last year. Center. The weak force, which is responsible for some kinds of radioactivity. All right, so the next force um, he's going to talk about is the weak force. And the weak force is the force that's in charge of the radioactivity. So we learned last year that all of us have radiation in our body, right? And where do we find that radiation? We learned this last year. Anybody remember? If it was in our body heat, the radiation would probably affect us. Where it's at, it doesn't, doesn't harm us. It's in the nucleus, remember? The radiation is found, radiation in our bodies is found in the nucleus of our cells, okay? So the weak force is in charge of the radioactivity. And that's not just in us, that's in all matters. And then you have the electromagnetic. And a lot of times I just call it electromagnetic instead of saying electromagnetism, okay? And it's responsible for the electricity in the light. Electromagnetism is responsible for electricity in light. If you remember earlier this year, we studied that uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, and that's where we learned about all the different colors of light that we have, and we learned the color spectrum and all that. Electromagnetism is, is responsible for all that. Thank you. Have you done it? Okay. Has everybody got that? Up to that point, everybody got that? Electromagnetism is responsible for electricity and light and is also the root cause of chemistry. And finally, gravity, which binds us to the earth and keeps. So then we have the gra gravitational force. Sometimes they refer to it as gravitational force. Sometimes they just refer to it as gravity. And it is um, responsible for its job, or however you want to say it, is one, it keeps us on Earth, okay? And two, is it keeps all of the planets in the solar system. The gravitational force from Earth keeps all the other planets in our solar system. Where they're supposed to be. Keeps the planets in their orbits around the sun. And yet the most interesting aspect of this picture is that at a point. All right, y'all get that? The gravitational force is to keep us on Earth, and it also keeps all of the solar system orbiting around the sun like it's supposed to. Fundamental level, scientists believe that all the forces come from one underlying force or principle. And astonishingly, not only that, but according to current understanding, all 24 of the different fundamental particles and the four forces are one and the same at some deep level. 
Okay, so what they're saying is that the beginning of time, right before the Big Bang Theory happened, is that all the forces were one entity, okay? So there was the um, gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, the strong force, and the weak force was all together into one entity. And that entity is smaller than, um, than a proton. But the main thing you need to know right now is that they were all together. That's, that's, that's the theory or the belief. And they don't know a whole lot. And they, they say the reason they don't know is that we don't, that's what, how far back in history that we can go. We can't go, we haven't been able to go any further back to prove anything. So that's where we begin. This is the alternate symmetry of the universe. Perhaps the best way to understand this and how these forces emerge is to visualize what happened at the very beginning of time, at the Big Bang, when everything was one. Time began not at zero, but at the smallest measurement of time that can be represented by our models of quantity. Okay, Planck time is the smallest measurement of time, okay? And that is when they believe uh, this was right before the Big Bang happened, okay? It was that what they call Planck time? And everything was all into one unit or entity. Okay, so Planck time is the smallest measurement measurement of time. The mechanics of that is Planck time. This is not zero, but pretty close from our perspective. Ten to the negative forty-three seconds. This is not to say that nothing that. exists prior species. to this, but it is just the limit of our knowledge. We are ignorant of anything that might have occurred prior to this first epoch of existence. So this is aptly called the Planck epoch. All the forces and particles were one and the same in a point smaller than the size of a proton. Gravity is thought to have separated from everything else shortly. Okay, so now Planck time is the smallest unit of time, and that's right before the Big Bang theory, and then when the Big or the Big Bang, and then when the Big Bang happened. We were in the epic theory of time. So the first thing to separate was the gravitational force. So put down gravity or gravitational force and know that it's the first thing that separated from the entity of all four of them. It came apart. Now, all of this happened within a, mo within a matter of minute seconds or whatever. It all happened, because think about when something blows up, what happened? I mean, it's pretty much all same time, right? But if you actually clocked and looked at everything and slowed it all down, you'll see that different pieces come out at different, even though it's minute times, okay? So the gravitational force was the first one to separate from that entity. After this time period. So it was the first force to separate out from the other three forces. The temperatures at this stage of the universe were, as you might expect, astronomical. 10 to the 31 degrees Celsius, and the energies were on the range of 10 to the 19 billion electron volts or giga electron volts. If we ever develop a theory of everything, then it would explain everything that occurred up to this time. The strings of string theory and the loops of loop quantum gravity, if those theories are correct, come into existence and apply here. The next bit. So what he's saying is if they're correct, then that's where they come in at, that they're still considered theories, so that's why they wouldn't, you know what I mean? A theory is not a fact, and we learned that last year. Era called the Grand Unified Epoch lasts from the first Planck second, 10 to the negative 43 seconds, to about 10 to the negative 35 seconds. Up to this period, the remaining three forces, the strong force, the weak force, and electromagnetism, were all united. But shortly after this period, from about 10 to the negative 34 to 10 to the negative 32 seconds, the strong force separated from the other two. Electro. All right, so if you notice, I was saying it all happens in minute time. If you'll notice the difference, that's not very much time difference, okay? Uh, the strong force separates. So the strong force is the second force to separate from, the, from that um, unit. So we have the weak, first the uh, gravitational force separated, then the weak force separated. I mean, the strong force separated, sorry. Then the strong force separated. For magnetism and the weak force, which were united as one force called the electroweak force, 
Temperatures were now around 10 to the 26 degrees Celsius, and the energy was reduced to 10 to the 15 giga electron volt. If we ever discover the grand unified theory of gut, which unites the strong force with the electroweak force, we would need to model what happens at these energy levels and temperatures. Somehow, the separation of the strong force is thought to have resulted or powered something called cosmic inflation. This is the. Okay, so uh, then we have the cosmic inflation that comes in, is what they call it. When the strong force separated, it caused this cosmic inflation. The momentary expansion of the universe, which went from. And that's um, a moment in time that the size of the universe went from being smaller than a proton to being as big as a grapefruit. So the comic inflation was the moment in time where the universe went from the size smaller than a proton to the size of a grapefruit. Do I need to go back so y'all can get the spelling on that? Cosmic inflation is when it went from being smaller, the universe went from being smaller than a proton to the size of a grapefruit. Or powered something called cosmic inflation. This is the momentary expansion of the universe which went from something tinier than the size of a proton to the size of a grapefruit. This is a huge increase in size. It's analogous to something as small as a tennis ball becoming the size of the solar system in a very small instant. At 10 to the negative 12 seconds, called the quark epoch, the electroweak force split into the... Okay, so at the, at the quark epoch, which is right after we expanded from um, smaller than a proton to a grapefruit, is when your electric magnetic force separates from your weak force. So we had gravity force first separated, strong force is number two, electromagnetic is three, which would leave the weak force is four, but you don't really separate, everything's separated from it. It's still where it was, okay? The weak force and electromagnetism. These two now became separate forces. So at this point, all the four forces became distinct. The temperature of the universe cooled to 10 to the 15 degrees Celsius, and energies are about 100 giga electron volt. We know a lot about the universe up to this era because such energy levels can be easily modeled in particle accelerators such as the Large Hadron Collider. So our understanding of the electric weak force is fairly robust. The Higgs field also exists at this stage as well. How do we know? Because about 100 giga electron volts is needed to create the Higgs boson, and this can be done at the LHC. Now, fast forward to today, 13.8 billion years later, where the average temperature of the universe is negative 270 degrees Celsius, and energy is on the order of 0.25 electron volts. Let's look closer at the four forces, and let's start with the two we are most familiar with, gravity and electromagnetism. They are similar in that- All right, so gravity and electromagnetism forces, gravitational force and the magnetic, electromagnetic forces, um, are similar because their mathematical formulas are almost identical, okay? So you need to know that they're the mathematical formulas for gravitational, force and the electromagnetic force is almost identical or similar. Their mathematical formulas look nearly identical. Newton's law of universal gravitation can be expressed as the following, where G is Newton's gravitational constant. Coulomb's law of electrical force between charged bodies can be expressed as the following, where K is Coulomb's constant. The first formula tells us the gravitational force between any two bodies is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the distance between them squared. Notice that the force extends infinitely far. This means that the Earth has a gravitational effect on not just the moon and the other planets of our solar system, but all. Okay, so the gravitational force not only has an effect on the moon, which we know it has an effect on our moon, right? 
It also has an effect on the other planets in our solar system and anything that it has, it says that's massive, but it means, it don't mean massive as in big, it means anything that has mass, okay? When you hear that, you think big, but it, so basically, Earth's gravitational force controls a lot of our universe, okay? So also some effect on every other massive object in the universe. Mind you, this is a very small effect because the R in the equation would be very large, the thing very far away. So the force would be very weak, but it is now zero. And since gravity affects anything with mass, this effect is the most influential force on the cosmic scale. But almost everything I just said also applies to electromagnetism. The electrostatic force between charges extends also infinitely far away. This means that a charged particle on Earth has a non-zero effect on a charged particle near Proxima Centauri, our nearest neighboring star, and charged particles everywhere else in the universe. And this force is much, much greater than the force of gravity. In fact, the... Okay, so the uh, electromagnetic force is a much, when he says greater, is a much stronger force um, than our gravitational force. But due to circumstances, it doesn't control as much as the gravitational force. So you need to know it has a much greater force than gravity does. Magnitude of electromagnetism is 10 to the 36 times greater than the magnitude of gravity. So why isn't electromagnetism the most dominant force in the universe? The reason is because on large scales, electric charges of large objects tend to cancel each other out. Large objects tend to be neutral. So All right, so large objects turn to, uh, are neutral. What does that mean, neutral? We learned this last year. What does it mean if it's neutral? If an object is neutral, what does that mean? It means it has no what? Yeah, it has no charge. You don't have a positive charge. You don't have a neutral charge. It's neutral. It's Switzerland. Okay, so if you have two large objects that don't have electrical charge, a positive or a negative, then they're neutral. They will not pull towards each other or away from each other. So basically that force cancels each other out. Okay? Does that make sense? Kind of? Any questions about that part? The main thing you need to know is that um, neutral, large things usually have a neutral charge, and that means they don't pull anything towards them or, 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 or away from them. So since a charged particle can only affect other charged particles, this force is mostly non-existent at large scale. If large things were not electrically neutral, this force would completely dominate our universe. But electromagnetism still has a big influence in our world. It is responsible for the nature of light. Okay, so our electric, ma uh, electric magnetic forces is responsible for the nature of light. And we learned that earlier this year when we studied the electromagnetic spectrum and that's in the, in, within the middle of that we have the light spectrum. So it's in charge, is responsible for the nature of light. And it is the main force responsible for all the biochemistry. And it's the main force that's responsible for biochemistry. And if we didn't have biochemistry, we wouldn't exist. Because the biochemistry is what takes place in our body. And so we have to have this electromagnetic force because it's responsible for that. It's also, it, and for the rest of the earth. So you'll find out that if we don't have all four forces all the time, then we as we know it and our Earth or our universe would not exist. Taking place in our body and the rest of Earth. It's the basis of all chemistry. So now you have that. Electromagnetics is the basis of all chemistry. If electromagnetism is so strong, then what keeps multiple protons, each of which are positive? Right. We're going to stop there because that's what I got with the other two classes. And then we'll pick back up there tomorrow. Okay, any questions?